Game on everyone! The grand final of the season two of the Heroes Hype Playoffs. The best of seven series. And some of you might look at the score and say like, but wait, Calder, this is game number one. Why is there a lead for the fan club already? Did you screw it up? And no, I didn't. Laos fan club made it into the grand final from the winner's bracket in a double elimination system. Nothing changed, just defeated, washed up in the loser bracket final and has now claimed their spot in the grand final here. But also, if you come from the winner bracket, you get an advantage in the best of seven series. You have a 1 0 lead over your opponent. So the best of seven series starts with the winner bracket's advantage, therefore, a 1 0 lead for the fan club as we're heading into Cursed Hollow. And I am pleasantly surprised we have Cursed Hollow as our first map. It's one of my favorite maps, honestly. Back in the day, it was the only map. <laughs> best of three series were pretty much exclusively played on Cursed Hollow. It was kind of. Fun and annoying at the same time it was a little bit weird. The map pool got obviously very heavily increased by Blizzard. One would argue, me being one of them, that we have way too many maps in the game for any competitive scene because, as you can tell, the game knowledge of the average player is pretty low. And that unfortunately applies to objectives on the map, to rotations on the map, and makes it really difficult. So uh, a smaller map pool would probably benefit the game quite a bit and then just balance those map a little bit, uh, maps a little bit differently. But as it stands, with Cursed Hollow usually not being played, we could see a few heroes that on other maps might not shine the same way. Abatha gets banned out, amongst other things, for that reason. There is still the chance that we're seeing, let's say, Falstad and also Tyrael. Tyrael in particular with Sanctification is around the two bosses, quite powerful. So is the Gust. <laughs> yeah, there we go. ETC gets taken right away. Falstad also for Chris, who has played a lot more Falstad recently in this tournament, not only here in the Grand Final now. And sport Billy again with Marganus. It was actually kind of funny because Billy was invited into the Grand Final lobby and he comes in the lobby and he's like, what do you mean we have to play again? Like, what's going on here? What is this? Is this the best of three? Is this the best of five? And I'm like, you do know that you have to play the grand final now. You just won the loser bracket final. It's like, we do? <laughs> he had no idea. And that was kind of funny. It was just like, all right, let's go, let's go. Let's make this a quick four mapper and win four in a row or something. Uh, but this is still a pretty cool series because, I don't know, just something in the back of my head always thought we would look at another washed up versus Lauba's fan club series. And that's not the case. Nothing changed, played an incredible loser's bracket uh, final. Let's just be honest about this. Linked now with Rega, also Potiboss and Dehaka. So you can already tell, on Cursed Hollow, a lot of globals. False set in, Dehaka in, Lauba with ETC, who can always go into stage dive. So there's a lot of global mobility that is being used here. And yeah, globals are really important here for sure. So with the heroes banned, and in this case, we actually have... Uh, so I think I have to explain this real quickly, even though usually I go over it during the drafts. The ban against Garrosh is here for a reason. Some people might argue, hey, why do they ban Garrosh if ETC is already picked? The reason is that ETC is a choice that the fan club makes a lot early on in the game, and then they decide if they want to play him in the main tank role or on the off lane with Echo Paddle on level 7 and Stage Dive on level 10. And that's why Nothing Changes looked at this and said, okay, if they have Garrosh plus ETC's power slide, this is just too much for us. We don't know where they want to play it, so let's ban Garrosh out there. Vala gets picked for Ty, and that's already insane. That's cool. And, well, Malfurion for Henning. Hanzo for DAB, and Junkrat again for Bleak Hitney, which we've now seen several times. He really likes to play around the hero. And, yeah, this is a good map for it, too. Last pick. We still need either Hero for Copenhagen or for Lauba, and there's Blaze. So ETC Blaze played in game number one of this best of seven. Again, that's the 1-0 lead for the fan club because of their winner bracket advantage as we are heading into Cursed Hollow, Cursed Hollow, ladies and gentlemen, in the grand final of the Heroes Hype Premier Series. Game number one, Cursed Hollow it is, and our grand final starts off with Henning on Malfurion, Chris on Falstad, Ty on Vala, Copenhagen on ETC, and Lauba is playing Blaze. Main tank Blaze for him again. Played this a lot on Infernal Shrines lately, with normally Leo coming in as the second hero for additional wave clear. Linked then again for nothing changed on the right side with Rhaegar. I mean, that's pretty much synonymous these days. Linked on Rhaegar is just a thing. And at this point, Polyboss on Dehaka, Bleak Kidney on Junkrat, DAB on Hanzo, and Sport Billy on. Malganis. Let's go! Arrow build also for Vala. 
it has a twofold effect actually in this case. Now, first of all, you can obviously play either around a multi shot build or around narrow build on this map. You're gonna fight a lot of these fights around objectives, so that's where you get a lot of value out of the arrow and will get good damage out. And the, ad the advantage is that with your level 1 with Monster Hunter, you now have also a chance to really take down bosses extremely quickly. And that is absolutely invaluable on a map where you have two bosses and can sometimes get a huge lead by just simply getting a boss quickly rotate to the other side of the map and take the second one too so this is going to be incredibly important but well with this we have at the bottom of the map Falster currently sitting tight the problem is he's going up against Billy and Blick Hitney yeah there's the follow up but he should still be able to get out of this one eat some damage though no? But these are the kind of plays that we can expect right now. Billy with a setup for Blick Kidney's grenade. On the other hand, then also the Haka with the potential borrow and a Tong plus drag, and then making the play there. Now Monster Hunter gets already some value towards the top left. Bottom right, we're seeing pretty much the same thing. As we already have our little attack here. And yeah, I'm actually pretty excited for this one. This grand final after the performance we've just seen from... Uh, nothing changed is going to be incredibly important okay top side Copenhagen and Podiboss already both sitting there Chris at the bottom of the map against the kidney and well this is gonna be one of the matchups that we're going to see quite a bit two damage dealers here trying to make their play <laughs> flap 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 I still want the pirate honestly the best taunt that we have in the game or one of the best ones is just like the pirate jumping around the entire time uh, <laughs> it's just the best thing and I enjoyed that a lot I mean this is one of the best dances not taunts but yeah it's pretty cool when it comes to okay level 4 abilities for both of the teams we now have puncturing arrow on level uh, 4 and the stacking is going to begin in just a moment with Taino sitting bot side we're gonna have well, the defense against the siege shines. This is one of the important things if you're playing globals here. Oh, actually, the camp is also getting attacked, and Billy moved in pretty deep. Falset is flying in. Global action, and the Haka is coming in too. It's a party, ladies and gentlemen. And the camp gets stolen away. Tanning is low. Tie on the run. Gets dragged and escapes. There was no trust here. Wow. They could have gotten the kill against Tai, but they didn't get it because nobody trusted the Haka to get the drag, but at least they take down Lauber. ETC is still sitting at the top. Couldn't really move in here. What a setup and what a start for nothing changed right into this little setup. Well played here. Yeah, that was actually pretty sweet. So Blikitney is already going for the channel now. No interrupts available for them and that uh, definitely has shaken the blue team a little bit. They just lost the camp, they lost the hero, they lost the first tribute. It's a bit of a setback. It's nothing horrible yet. So you can tell the experience lead is minor. But it is definitely something where you're just looking at it is like, oh um, yeah, that's annoying. There's a drag, pretty fantastic actually. Henning, if he gets body blocked, is also gonna fall and he dies. <laughs> what is it with nothing changed today? What the hell did these guys have for breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> Shake those hips, baby. Shake them. Hips don't lie. Neither does Sport Billy. <laughs> Sits there and wiggles a little bit right in front of Blaze and just says, What are you going to do? What are you going to do, baby? Seven versus seven. Two old lead and kills and the earlier talent. Now we also have a repeating arrow and the boomerang. Billy this time is not able to lock Chris down. And he plays the safe again. But yeah, nothing changed. They. They definitely had their wheat picks this morning. Okay, Blick Hitney. Jumping out now too, and this is objective number two. So the second tribute. It's one of the cool things about the map, that you can let a tribute slide and it doesn't have an immediate impact onto your team. So, well, let's see. For now, there we go. Big attacks come through, but it's not enough to interrupt Henning. And uh, of course, that is another little poke and a first tribute for the blue team. The problem with the fan club is, even if they fall behind, their potential to come back in the later stages of the game is pretty much unrivaled. Outside of Team Russia, who were pretty much known as the comeback team, I don't think there are a lot of teams that are in any way able to have such a huge comeback setup as the fan club. Their late game synergy is incredible, and that oftentimes has helped them to come back from being a talent down. And uh, 
so the lead isn't even that big this game. It takes time for nothing changed. But it's cool to see the series start off with some serious action from nothing changed because with the winner bracket advantage that we had for the fan club, this is obviously something that always is a bit of a concern for an opponent's team. Ah, but let's just assume for a moment nothing changed wins this one. If they take it, that pretty much reduces the entire series to a best of five between the two teams. Half a level until 10. Obviously only objective or uh, tribute number two for no matter who takes it. The Haka has to defend against top lane's Siege Giants. And if they can just delay this a bit, it should be fine. Bot lane has already been defended by Falstad. Copenhagen is going to be interrupted here for sure. Yep, even getting uh, the... Uh, the Hans ability out again. Vala in the middle, working on those talents. By the way, two stacks only for Vala, not really a whole lot. And there's the level 10 abilities. Uh, do we see an arrow? Is there any kind of engage? Are they gonna try and force a fight? No, no, no. No, no, no. no force, instead just taking the tribute. Freebie again for the red team. Only thing they had to do was wait it out. Don't allow the blue team to take it before heroics drop and then you're good. But now we have on both sides heroic abilities, and there's the stage dive. So our ETC, as expected, goes for the stage dive. They take the boss at the top side, and right now there is no effort to take the boss over here. That's an issue. That's a big problem. If they go for the boss right now, they might actually lose this as well. Ah, well, they have Monster Hunter, they should, yeah, 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 you can really tell there's an incredible difference in speed on the two teams. With Hanzo's build, they don't have the extra damage, I mean, just look how much later they started this, and they are still able to get it just a few seconds after their opponent. Just imagine the setup without Monster Hunter on Tai and, let's say, a normal multi-shot build, that attack from Billy and Dehaka would have probably been successful. At least it would have forced the fight. Not saying that they would have necessarily won it, but now it's still an even trade in bosses. But this could have definitely backfired very, very quickly against the fan club if they didn't have Vala with the movie shot and that extra pressure against mercenaries here. So, okay, as we're speaking, we actually have our constant poke here still coming through. Billy is moving away from this, and they can still let this one slide, and I think they have to. The position is still just a little bit awkward. There is the attempt to still zone that out, and I mean, Jungle gets another grenade through, but now the tie moves towards the front. He can only do that, trading out for some damage. Dehaka on the bot lane, nearly taking the boss down. Chris is still there. Dehaka is actually going to move in from the side, but yeah, he's not going to get it. That's going to be an even exchange. Two for two. Oh, <laughs> beautiful kill. Nicely done. Good kill, and they go for Henning. Is there a drag? No, <laughs> the isolation. Hits Blaze, yeah, he's pretty much, um, yeah, he's actually pulling a Bruno Mars here. Catch a grenade for you! You're gonna catch my fist in a moment, you crybaby. Three kills against zero, but either way, uh, yeah, he just jumped into the way of the isolation and was hit by it full on. Malfurion would have likely fallen. So with this, we still have the three kills against zero and the lead, and this is Tribute 3. And that tribute is actually uh, pretty impactful. That's going to be a curse one way or another. And the talent advantage that concerns me slightly for... Uh, makes me concerned for nothing changed because, yeah, they are, in this situation at least, able to maybe force that fight with that power spike. There's the setup against the dirty trickster here. Okay, Dehaka comes in. False that isn't here yet either. That's another problem. A good drag and they might get a kill, but they're not able to quite pick it up. False that... Oh, Chris! Oh my god! The bird with the death wish here. I mean, I have heard of the early bird, but the suicidal bird has apparently made an appearance. Chris surviving thanks to the barrel roll, but that was a close one. Isolation again on Blaze. He's getting uh, pretty beat up by this. And even the gust had to be used by Chris in order to move out of harm's way here. And they can get a connect against... I mean, just look how they're getting poked down there. Hansel's arrow the entire time. Then we have the grenades coming in. This is looking worse and worse for them. Just look at the mid lane. There's a camp that's starting to pressure down the fort. This is bad news, especially since this channel is pretty much a guarantee. And that would put the curse squarely into the hands of nothing changed. Time to split out on the lanes and gather the experience. Already Blikitney moving bot side. That fort should be a goner and that's the pressure. That's where the pressure comes through right away. Three kills against zero. We have Blikitney at the bottom of the map now 
and that is a very very solid aggression against the top fort the mid fort even the bottom of the map i doubt that all three of them will fall but there will be significant damage oh my god and they're actually going for chris Ooh, chris wants the counter kill chris is actually looking for the counter killer with etc wow Blikitney jumps out, but the rest of the team rotates in. And that's actually true for both of them at this point. Arrow, and it connects. Riptire is on its way, connects with both of them. The curse still going strong. Top lane gets attacked, Tranquility is in. False dad, Blikitney, the trickster, the ancestral, and he lives. And he jumps into the fray, into the full on team fight. Blikitney finally falls, but so does Malfury, and Rega is dead too. It's a fiesta. Kills everywhere. Chris is down and over to the right. Blaze dies. A 2 4 4 trade. Ah, <laughs> a 3 4 3 trade. And damn, every single fort has fallen. Mid gate has taken damage towards the top. Similar picture. What a curse by nothing changed. Holy hell. <laughs> Half a level lead for them, six kills against three, and this is pretty bonkers. I mean, this is really insane. DAB right now, uh, I mean, he must be feeling good. That arrow in particular set the entire, set all this up at the bottom. The only thing that could have been more perfect for nothing change would have been if Blikitney survived all of this. That ancestral mid-air. And actually it went through, puts him on full HP and he survives long enough to have another impact in the game. 28,000 for Hans or 23,000 for him. And bosses get attacked again. And without Va- oh no, Vala's here, sorry. I didn't see her in the minimap. But yeah, Vala can obviously just murder the boss. I talked about it at the beginning of the game. It hasn't changed. Uh, a bit slower this time, but you can already tell that they are even looking for keep now. Yeah, already starting to rush towards Copenhagen and hope that they can take ETC down too, even though I don't think that's going to happen. Blind as a bat for uh, Batman. Sport Billy wants to lock that down. The big difference between the bosses is that there's still a fort at the bottom of the map. There's still a fort on the other side, and that's a huge difference for sure. All right, Kemp gets attacked. Billy is on the point. Oh, good arrow, but he still falls. Billy down. Chris is moving away. Porty Boss is in a bit of danger. Ford at the bottom of the map is about to fall. At the same time, they're still fighting for the camp a little bit longer. They already have Copenhagen. He's sliding in again, looking for another kill. But he's the turn around, and the cow is down. The jet propulsion hits, though, and that's the end of Hanzo. Everybody's on the run. Rega is there, too. The problem is the boss is already on the keep. And, well, the more time they can buy, it might... Nah. It's not going to take it down. It's going to severely damage it, but they are not going to lose it. And now the trouble is brewing for nothing changed because this is spawning in 20 seconds. And if you just look at the death timers here, yeah, this isn't looking pretty at all. Not at all. This is going to be a curse against the red team. Now, they have lost the fort at the bottom of the map, but they're not going to lose that keep. And they're not even taking damage on the keep. But they're going to eat that curse now. And that's a problem. I mean, look at the zone out here. Already Blaze is just sitting there. I'm actually activating the camp before the curse is taken. Trying to put some pressure onto the lane. Honestly, I don't know if Sport Billy is going to stay here. I highly doubt it. Takes one down. Oh, he is still delaying that. Wow. Yeah, apparently trying to bait them in a bit. But this is now going to hurt. This is really going to hurt. Top side is going to fall. And, yep, there we have it. They actually go for the camp in order to defend this a little bit more. Which is actually a fair point if you can get it. The thing is, they lost a lot of time trying to pull that off and the split of the fan club onto three lanes is going to guarantee them a lot of experience too but thanks to the camp they can now focus onto the top lane a bit more without losing too much ground in the middle of the map bottom of course that's where uh, uh, the Haka is making a stand so it's actually a smart choice it makes it much harder for etc to have an impact here as you can tell so there's a lot of time that has to be bought and that allows the curse to nearly dissipate before anything really happens. 15 stacks on Vala also means that the quest on level 4 isn't completed, so there's not really the full force of Vala unleashed yet. Seems like they're trying to make a play for Chris. Uh, he's already flying straight out. He knew that there was a rotation coming. He's just flying in the middle and saying, okay boys, I'm going to play this as safe as I possibly can. But, well, nearly even. Six kills against seven. It's a great start into the best of seven here. Great grand final opening on Cursed Hollow. Billy comes in, gets his ult through. 
Maybe not quite as much as value as you're hoping for. And the arrow completely dodged out. Yeah, and yeah, the bottom of the map. Body boss with a value on the global. <laughs> it's clutched. There's still a Ford in the game, but this is not going to survive for much longer. 20 should actually be ready for the two teams at the same time. Nice cleanse. Good job actually moving out here. They're going for Billy again. They want to fight before Storm Talons are part of this. But this is a tough one. Can the fan club take this? When they ate the first curse and they lost every single Ford, it looked really bad for them. There's a lot of heroes that died in that encounter at the bottom of the map too, but then uh, the fight at the top boss, that really, really helped them. Now the fort is down, and as we still have a pretty significant damage output, especially on the side of Falstad and Vala, for the blue team, that is, we are looking also to level 20 abilities, and with level 20, there's a lot of opportunities of what they could pull off right now. First of all, Contagion, that doesn't come as a surprise. Storm Shield, Bullseye, we have Cannonball. And I'm more interested to see what the blue team actually takes. Okay, Far Flight Quiver for Vala, and ETC goes straight into the Bolt of the Storm, so more safety for him, moving out of harm's way, Fortified Bunker. And we have Wind Tunnel for Chris. Chris had a couple of amazing Wind Tunnel plays already. And for the bad Vanquish of the Week. Okay. That actually could help them a lot. I mean, there's a lot of slow opportunities too. So on the damage output side, that isn't too bad either. But this is all about the next team fight. I mean, keep in mind, without a single tribute in the hands of either one of the teams, it means that tributes at this point aren't really all that important. Bosses are honestly more important than tributes. Especially if the top boss is taken in a few seconds here, it means that this is going to fall and the core likely is going to get dropped too. So it's tough for the blue team to just go for these, yeah, well, for these exchanges, boss for boss, because the bottom keep has more hit points and that will slow down any approach when it comes to an actual race between the two of them. So that's why we're seeing Lauber and his boys jumping around at the top right now, because they're fully aware of that. They know they can't let this one go. And that's why Billy is also looking for it here too. Junkrat in the meantime with Copenhagen just dancing around, but I mean there's a double global for the blue team, so that gives them the upper hand. Yeah, this is why they're letting this one slide. ETC comes in, there's the stage dive, wants to go for Pony Boss. Lauba is going straight in, Wind Tunnel gets used, and the Ancestral comes through. Quick connect with the Riptire, but nothing that really forces the issue yet, or lets the kill appear somewhere. Yeah, Lauba is still coming in again. There's a couple of heroics still available. Fortified Bunker being one of them. Dark Conversion, Contagion, generally speaking. Nothing changed as the upper hand at this point. Oh, Copenhagen! ETC, the arrow, and it's a big one into the back line. The bunker is on the ground. Vala gets the quest completed, but this is looking grim. Billy, if he gets his ult through, and he does against Lauber. The dark conversion is in, and there's the chase, and that's the end. Oh, ETC survives. What? They take the camp, bullseye hits too, but they cannot get the kill. What a fight. The two teams really going for every single tool in the tool belt, but they cannot get the kill that they want. And now the aggression towards the boss. The Haka, in the meantime, moves down towards the bottom of the map, trying to take the tribute. This is a big push, obviously, that they have to face eventually. Boss. They let it leash and everybody is just dancing around here. Billy's still in slight trouble. Lauba gets the connect. Oh, and he cleanses. What a game. Tense as hell at this point. Everything centering around that top boss. Yeah, ETC is still at the bottom of the map. He defended the keep and the wall. The Haka is still floating around here, seeing if he can maybe set something up against the middle of the map. Push this out a bit more aggressively. Force the structures. Second tribute coming up. Ah, red team could steal this one away too. 63,000 damage from Hanzo. <laughs> this is a serious, serious move here. Yeah, Billy, they're actually going for the bottom boss now. Bottom against top boss. All right. It's the exchange. ETC sniffs it out. Definitely going to be too late to do anything about it. Unless Falstad is going to try and get a wind tunnel play. And Falstad is actually looking at it. Okay. Chris is going to try it. Wind tunnel and barrel roll. <laughs> These fuckers steal it away. <laughs> Old school. <laughs> Double boss for them. And they actually steal it. Okay, so now two bosses actually barreling down the lane. 
If they now can get a kill too, then this is just lights out. Oh my god. Old school move from Chris right here. I can't believe he actually tried to play and that he managed to pull it off too. It's just insane. So now Tranquility comes in. Keep at the top is going to get wrecked, of course. And at the bottom of the map, the same is going to happen. This is perfect. Absolutely perfect. Falls that with a perfect timing. Top is gonna fall. Bottom keep is going to get eliminated. The siege giants are moving in together with it. And this is looking like it's gonna be game. The fan club might get the 2-0 lead right here over their opponent. It's a slow progress. One boss is already on the core. The second one is coming in. Lauba. Oh, the contagion. And the wind tunnel is back again and immediately being used. Double boss on the core. You don't see that a lot. And yeah, there's absolutely no chance. <laughs> I'm sorry for the nothing changed fans, but there is no way to save this game here anymore. Game number one in the series ends, and therefore the 2-0 lead for the fan club as they take the victory on Cursed Hollow. GG, and well played. Game number two, everybody. There's a 2-0 lead, obviously, for the fan club, since they had a 1-0 advantage heading into this best of seven series through the winner bracket. But nothing changed on the last map. I mean, they fell into the good old Falstad trap. They were trying to control the point with Junkrat, and it didn't quite work out. But double boss wailing onto the core that late into the game, that's pretty much the end right there. So all of a sudden, it's a 2-0 in the best of seven for the fan club, and we are heading into Infernal Shrines as our next map. Ana, at this point, banned out immediately. And <laughs> I'm still trying to get over the last one. They're actually super quick right now with one map after another. I like it. I can absolutely appreciate that. Oftentimes we have to wait quite a long time, but it seems like they want to make sure that they're going to jump into the next game and get this get the second game uh, started. Tracer. I mean, the DA, the standard against versus DAB ban. Ban out DAB is Tracer. That's, that's just like the hero's ABC. <laughs> it's just the same. Brightwing is trash. You don't want to play uh, any of the former specialists. And you ban Tracer against DAB. That's pretty much the rules of the game. A little bit more to it than that, but yeah. So uh, there's a Johanna ban even. Ah, well, Infernal Shrines. She's pretty powerful on the AoE and, of course, on the Shrines themselves. She gets even more so value from that. But yeah, let's have a look at this. What are we going to get as the last one? Because now things are starting to become a bit more interesting. Okay, Hanzo gets banned out. With all the priority that we've seen from DAB onto the hero and only in this series, but in the previous one, if Tracer is banned out, that does make sense. I could have seen even a play a little bit more around Junkrat because so far, I mean, Blikitna has gone into Junkrat whenever he could. So yeah, that was a big one there uh, throughout this entire thing. But let's see, first pick. Ah. The rat, the rat. Junkrat gets taken, and again, doesn't come as a surprise. Good map for him. Blikitne really likes to play around him. The displacement is there. You have the outside poke on the shrine for minions. So, yep, that's pretty much that. Yeah, and then again, uh, we could see the early blaze. Early blaze plus Leo would actually work here. Hello. Yeah, blaze. No Leo yet. Malfurion for uh, the heals. But I still actually think that Leo could make it into the uh, side lane and Blaze as the main tank for for Lauber. I said it actually in the last draft or in the last game that they love to play that style on Infernal Shrines where they use Blaze in the main tank position from Lauber and add even more AoE to Blaze's oil spill with them popping Leo in with a skeleton swing. But now Garrosh for Sport Billy, so he's on one of his comfort heroes and we have linked on Alex Straza. That in itself is already telling because he moved away from his Rhaegar that he's been playing consistently so far. So the Dragon Queen can get popped out and that's normally a very cool tool if Oh wow, they ban him? Okay. Fair enough. Let's see what they're gonna play in the main tank position then. Now well, Malganis gets banned out immediately after the Leo ban, and I understand that perfectly. But yeah, popping Alexstrasza on the shrine normally guarantees you that you have a fantastic position for the fight. Lasts for roughly half the shrine, so most of the teams will pop it after they have 20 stacks acquired. 
And until Deathwing comes into uh, the game, Alexstrasza is the only real dragon that we have. There is a pretending, uh, pretending sand witch or sand gnome, but she's the only real dragon. Uh, Lauber now with ETC, plus Ty on Jaina, which leaves us with Chris and a hero for him. I mean, plenty that he could take now. But let's actually see how the draft gets rounded out by nothing changed as they are going into the last two picks for them. We need something for DAB in the damage department. And Vala is up. Great pick if you want to take her here. And Pody Boss on the side lane can also add a bit more sellability. There's Urel. And there's Vala. Which leaves Chris. I mean, maybe even with the bird again. He played so much false set lately that I would not be shocked if he does it once more in this game here. He seems to really, really love to play around the hero. I think it was actually on this map where he went even into an auto attack build. I might mix things up here, but he went into a season marksman build just the other day. I just can't put my finger on which map it was, if it was Infernal Shrines or not, but Boomerang gives you, of course, a lot here. But let's see. Last pick for him. Chris, what are we going to get? It's Sylvanas. I'm a dummy, of course. Sylvanas still open. My bad. That was an obvious one. Game number two, ladies and gentlemen. Let's jump in. Grand Final, Heroes High Premier Series, the playoffs of Season 2 and the Grand Final. Who's going to be the champion? Let's jump straight in, Infernal Shrines. Game 2, Infernal Shrines, the 2-0 lead in the best of 7 for the fan club, thanks to their winner bracket advantage. And now we are going into Infernal Shrines. Heading on Malfurion, Chris on Sylvanas. Copenhagen on Blaze, Ty on Jaina, and Lauba on ETC. On the right side of the map, nothing changed with DAB on Vala, Blikitni on Junkrat, Polyboss on URL, Sport Billy on Garrosh, and we have Linked on Alex Straza. All right. So, well, let's see. I mean, at this point, we've seen an incredible uh, loser bracket final between nothing changed and washed up that was surprisingly to me at least ended with a pretty pretty clean win for nothing changed but game number one gave the fan club an even bigger lead in this grand final and in the best of seven the first team to reach four wins is going to claim victory but right now the fan club is always already halfway there so on map number two it's kind of important that nothing change makes a play it's oftentimes ridiculous what kind of insane comebacks you can see in Heroes of the Storm and I mean we have seen in the history of the game in esports a lot actually even best of seven series that were turned around but to be honest with you it is incredibly rare it is nearly impossible to pull that one off win four in a row after you got bodied already in uh, the previous matches so we'll find out if nothing changed can pull it off, but if they win here, they won't have to. So if they can put the first point onto the board, that would be a bit of a relief, I would assume. And we'll see if they can pull this off in uh, game number two on Infernal Shrines. Monster Hunter, so an arrow build for DAB. Also, Urel, slight adjustment with the light of Karabor. A lot more popular these days. And the team's just looking for the camps again. I've been harping about the way that the fan club always controls the uh, mercenary experience. And in this case, nothing changed. Just trying to uh, lock that down early on for themselves instead of just simply giving them up and allowing them to take that small lead in experience. In terms of talents, we have in level 1 the Might of the Banshee Queen again. Pretty much the standard these days for Chris on Sylvanas. Very heavy damage output from him usually. And with his safe play, he oftentimes ends up being the player that has zero deaths in the game. First stack acquired for Vala on the level 4 talent. A little bit of a chase actually against Chris here in the middle. Or at least an attempted one. The Hand of Freedom for Urel. Uh, Boss is already on the move back. And yeah, a little bit of a slow start. And we've actually seen this throughout the entire tournament. This is one of the reasons why it's so reminiscent about uh, of HTC. Because you see teams really playing it incredibly safe now that there's quite a bit of money on the line. We don't see these just YOLO moves from the get-go, just fighting it out with teamfight after teamfight. Oftentimes it comes to a lot of just significant battles, but the teams are playing this a lot safer than they normally do in, let's say, a qualifier. And that can only be appreciated because it leads to a much higher level of play as well. Nice setup against Billy. A lot of free damage on him. Body blocks are there too. Oh my god, Billy might actually fall. And should survive? Well, maybe not. Is the power slide ready? Yeah, but not enough to really body block him at the front again. Junkrat isn't here yet. 
has delivered a slight lead in experience for them. DAB taking a beating from Christo and Kopenhagen actually is all of a sudden the one in trouble as he gets pushed back, gets isolated and gets taken down. Blaze goes down in a blaze of glory, but with this kill, we have a 5 versus 4 setup on the first objective for the red team. Nothing changed, is attempting to jump in. That's another 7 seconds until Blaze is back, but as mentioned previously, Alex Traza is incredibly powerful on the shrine once you have taken the lead over your opponent in the minion stacks. And this is something that we're going to see Link used for sure. And I'm pretty sure that they can. There's even a level 7 advantage that we should see for them momentarily. So, great setup for uh, nothing change. 20 stacks, can drop the Dragon Queen, there it is. Level 7 is in, and good luck trying to fight back against that. The fan club is, yeah, they're immediately abandoning the, the spot. Immediately moving back, they're like, all right, this one's done. Can't do it, not against Alexstrasza, not this early on with Dragon Queen and Elite in their hands, not with level 7 already grabbed by them. Uh, yeah, that ain't happening, so instead, let's just rotate onto lanes. Look at Chris. Again, Chris is one of the safest players in this game. He could have walked through here. A lot of people would have, but he already anticipated the trap. And even if there's no trap, he just said, like, why risk it? Chris has done this through his entire career. If you want to catch Chris off guard in this game, then you have to wake up pretty early. Granted, in the past, he had actually a long time where he played it maybe a bit too safe and therefore missed out on potential damage. But especially when he started to play with the Zealots and with ADRD, a lot of that changed and he became even stronger than before. So a pretty impactful player from the beginning of Heroes of the Storm to now. And incredibly safe. And I know that it seems a little bit silly when someone just like walks across the map and doesn't fall into a trap that is so obvious to us as we have full vision to say like, oh, of course, that's, well, of course he moves there, no big deal. But how many times have we seen heroes face checking bushes that are way farther out there or taking just the medium safe path and then getting annihilated by an opponent that was just lying in wait. In this case, that is not happening and that's why the team is currently looking at only half a level of a disadvantage. So for now, top side, Copenhagen, the safe play, looking for experience. The fight at the bottom of the map, that's a 5 versus, four, uh, versus 3 actually. Uh, you don't want to take that battle. But everybody is still moving around the position so far, no problems for them. Yeah, but I gotta say, nothing changed. Is starting to build up some momentum here. They have a slightly different experience. They got the first kill, they got the first objective. They haven't really done a whole lot with it. I mean, they broke through the wall in the middle, but they haven't taken the four down. But the early level 10 might just give them an opportunity to go straight in for a kill. But they're definitely, they're definitely looking to make it difficult for the fan club to have any kind of momentum here. So, level 10 abilities, there they are. One flip, one stun, no follow up just yet. DAB playing it safe here too. Warlord's challenge, of course. Riptire. Should also see. Uh, well, on, uh, Ruby Wings would have been a little bit early for uh, Alex Straza. But uh, you know what I mean. So, the Cleansing Flame, most likely gonna come out for her. Top lane pressure as Pody Boss moves in with his Ardent Defender. No Sacred Ground, which we've actually seen from Whoopi a lot in this tournament. And with level 10 abilities now on the other side, we are getting Mosh Pit over Stage Dive. Tranquility again. And interesting enough, Alex is still not making the choice. Ah, there we go. All right. Cleansing Flame it is. For just a moment, I was thinking, wait a second. Is he actually? No, he's not. 10 stacks on Vala. So she's halfway done with the quest now. Sylvanas again with a few more camps here. And let's not forget that we also have in terms of quest talents for the Pyromania on uh, the level 1 side with new habits, an opportunity to get the unstoppable just before the next objective spawns. That's another 30 seconds out, but if Blaze is just a little bit diligent about these globes, you should easily be able to complete that. ETC needs another 5. That isn't out of the realm of possibility either and would go a long way, but I'm not sure if they really have the time for that. So he might try. There's also two missing for Jaina, so yeah, Globe Talents could really make the difference here. Talking Jaina, she goes straight into the Water Elemental in this case. There's still Urel towards the top. Pushing the bot lane, one more for Ty to get the quest completed, but well, doesn't look at it just yet. Urel on the way down, there's the quest completion, nicely played, and it's time to shine. The lead for the fan club this time on the objective. Podiboss jumps in, but it's nothing that they're there, because the rest of the team was already moving away from it. 
Dragon Queen hasn't been popped yet and they're still attempting to lock down Spot Billy. There's the ult from Alex Straza. Strafe gets used too, but the AB gets only medium value out of it. Can't really get too close to them at this point. It's pretty much even though. And the Mosh Pit against three! And the immediate reaction from Alex Straza, but Vala is down, Junkrat is dead, Billy might be in trouble, gets the taunt through against Chris, but now the rush away towards the gate as both of the melee heroes are taking a beating here. And this is the fan club once again with a dominant performance in the team fight. Still a problem topside, and it seems like Blaze will split off to deal with it. But the rest of the team is securing this one. Well played by them. Really, really well done right now. So they move straight down towards the bottom lane. Let's see how much they can actually do with this. The pretty sweet one here. So at this point, having the immediate attack against the gate. Yeah, Blaze topside might even give them the level 13 talent as they're pushing in. Reptile! Even if you can't get the hero damage, if you take the minion wave down, that's already all you need to do to shut that attack down cold. Or at least, like limit the uh, the impact a little bit that it's gonna have. But they kill the wall, they nearly take down the fort. Oh, oh that's a good taunt though. That's a kill. ETC down! Completes this quest and goes straight YOLO. Nah, didn't really YOLO here, but it was a good move from Sport Billy. I mean, there's a reason why Garrosh is banned oftentimes against this team, and against him in particular. He is delivering. 13 for both sides now. With that, we also have Remorseless, as usual. And the nature's swiftness. Run, Malfurion, run. Yeah, Malfurion likes to play Forrest Gump here. Two kills against two. Yeah, it's close. Again, this is an awesome series. The loser bracket final was pretty much the same. Results notwithstanding, the just like the way that the maps play out is an absolute delight in this tournament. It's really a lot of fun. Vision should be granted over here. Oh, actually, they don't. Okay, they would have helped them to get the fountain. Which eventually they should get either way. But they are even trying to force the fight with the water elemental, but Junkrat is already topside. But they have to still deal with that. Okay, Fountain is down one way or another. The fort is also eating a bit of damage, but it's only on half HP. And despite the fact that we're 10 minutes into the game and we've seen two Punishers now, there's no fort eliminated yet. This is actually the first Fountain that was destroyed. Fountain in the bot lane is still there. Lauba. Okay, quick slide. That one was needed. Riptire, the taunt. Can they still get it? They push him back. Lauba should be totally fine here. Yeah, and Chris actually moved in for some serious damage, but he's dead. The problem is that Vala might die too. No, they don't have the damage there. They don't have the follow-up from Blaze. So, yeah, Chris is down. And Lauba is not out of harm's way yet either. He's actually trying to dash out. Oh, good move. Nice move by Polyboss. DAB was for just a second. A bit threatened. Another power slide, but Billy has is having none of it. <laughs> I like this game. This is a lot of fun. It's actually really cool. So 14 versus 15, two kills against three. And nearly a completed quest for Vala on her level four. So that's going to increase the damage output. And talking about damage output, 21,000 for Vala, 14,000 for Sylvanas. And the first death on Chris. Still a couple of heroes that haven't fallen in this game. Talk about falling. Uh, Ty. Ty. Billy coming in from behind. And that's an easy kill. The mosh pit is perfect. And can they get more? They're trying. Likitni. He survives again. But it's Alex Straza that falls. And we're seeing Garrosh fall too. Ty at this point is probably really pissed. Can you imagine that mosh pit coming through with Ty still being alive and just dropping the damage? He would have been able to murder the entire ensemble. But as it stands, it's still a two for one trade, so it's a win at the end of the day. A lot of this happened, of course, because Billy was just like sharking around here and could catch him from behind. That's definitely an angle that Jaina did not expect, I can tell you that much. 16 for both now, and especially on Vala, that's going to be interesting because there's so many choices. And yep, we actually have Manticore picked up. There's always seething hatred if you want to go in full on onto the mage build, so to say, but Manticore is just such a great talent, especially once that you have your level 20 and can go into the far flight quiver for the continuous auto attacks. It's just insane. Laser fire is in, all of a sudden Podiboss all at the front, camps at the top, 
17 against 5 stacks, and there needs to be a commitment for nothing changed. You need to go in for it. It's popular already looking inside here. Dragon Queen has been popped. They're trying to make the play here. They're trying to go for the move. Here comes the silence. The Sylvanas is going Komark with the jet propulsion. He connects the stack. But Yon Ruby Wings saves Alex Strauss and the rest of the team as the Riptire is coming out to once again drop the damage into the hands of the fan club. And the backline is already rushing out of this one. Tranquility is getting used in the bunker. Drop on the ground to Lauber with a slide, but he doesn't have it. Mortar Punisher is taken. And the team in red on the retreat. Portibos trying to cover it. So does Alex Raza. Billy with a save. And he himself is still dead. Sacrificing his life for the, uh, for the well-being of the team. Whoa. 16 versus 16. Kill after kill after kill. It is just crazy. It's just a trade-off every single time. They go, for, they go blow for blow here over and over again now the mid lane attack the fort is down blaze is saving the top lane once more as it did previously but they're moving towards the keep in the middle and they might actually get this one especially with garage not being here it's difficult to withstand that much pressure water elemental soaking up a few more shots and they are really bringing the pain right now sylvanas is enhancing every single push that they set up here and they're going to get this one they're going to get it that keep is going to fall they get the keep in the mid lane or do they? Yeah, they do. Or do they? <laughs> Harry the Archer was actually taking it down. <laughs> For just a moment, I was like, you're kidding, right? You're kidding. The Punisher doesn't deal with it. And then it's Harry. Good old Harry. Harry the minion. He's sitting there and is like, I got your back, boss. I got your back. Goes in and drops the final... The final spear, that's pretty much what it was there. <laughs> it would have been hilarious if that thing uh, would have still kept standing after this one, but yeah. The yeah, minion MVP. Now, talking about MVPs, I mean, I gotta admit that so far, when you just look at damage numbers, the MVPs on both sides are definitely the girls here. First of well, actually, not all of them, because Jaina has not quite the damage output that Sylvanas brings to the table. On top of that, you have Vala with 35,000 on the top damage in the game. But yeah, the keep is down, and the fort has been eliminated too. The lead is still tiny. I mean, half a level. The passive experience is going to extend that soon. But we'll actually see how much more they are going to get here. There's a pretty big rotation. And rotations like this, with just burning a wave down, and then covering retreat with ETC's face melt here, is all that they really need to do. Oh wow, they're getting freebie damage onto Billy, and they might get the kill here. They're committing. They're actually committing to this. And Billy walks away. Bunker on the ground. Sylvanas moves away from it too. Henning is a bit low. Still tied with the attack against Blikitten at the right side, but they're jumping in again and they're making another play with a stage dive against Ural. Didn't uh, the mosh pit against Ural? She didn't have time to go for her old and falls. Ha <laughs> ha! The fan club again. They get the kill and they are making it happen. Six kills against four, half a level until 20. But this is looking great. And uh oh, Blikitten. Oh, <laughs> Ty just spears him up, and that stagger death just hurts. Are they going core? Oh, they might go for Alexstrasza. <laughs> yeah, Link is at the top. Is like, uh, I don't want to be here. Can some like team, team, help, help? And uh, yep, there's another slide. Lopa, <laughs> don't tell me he dies now. <laughs> he actually survives this, but the rest of the team is still on the run, and Link gets barely saved as Billy goes for the throw. But the fort is still down, and level 20 is ready. And with Storm Talons, with 7 kills against 4, they start to move topside for the next shrine. And boy, is this starting to hurt. I mean, this is just incredible. It's insane how strong the fan club is, seriously. These guys are just incredibly powerful. And in the post-HTC era, the top three teams, nothing changed. Lauber's fan club, and also washed up. They're just spectacular. This is, this is seriously some solid performance, and also, of course, great synergy that we're seeing from these players. The follow-ups that we have with every single attack that they go for, the CC stacks, and that's just chains, lock a target down, and then drop the damage, are incredible. I like that they steal this camp away. I really like that move. It's a little bit of a risky one, but Billy is sitting at the side to anchor the play, so that will lessen the impact of this push a tiny little bit. 
Not by much. Actually, it doesn't do anything now that I think about it because they haven't really taken the Punisher yet. They're actually waiting this out. So yeah, they could take the camp down first, or at least the Shaman. There's still camps taken at the bottom of the map. It's, it's smart. It's honestly smart from uh, Nothing Changed that they make these plays. It gives them level 20 for the defense, and it also helps them to pressure the lanes a bit more, which over here is going to result in the fort destroyed. So if the game doesn't end here, have a bit of a better situation. The problem is Sylvanas. She is empowering this push even more. I mean, towers are already disabled as the move comes in. And with level 20, there's still a lot of... Oh, Vala just disappears! He's, she's just completely gone! It's exactly the synergy that I've been talking about. She's there and then she's gone. They look for the next kill. The keep is gonna fall and they might even go for game here. There's an attempt at a mosh pit from Lauba. Now, if he gets a good one through, then this is definitely over. And it looks like one way or another, the game is gonna end right now. And that would be a 3-0 lead in this best of seven for the fan club. They're still looking for the opportunity. Dance, baby, dance! And Garrosh is down, showing us the moves before he bites the dust. And this is going to be it. 3-0 in the best of seven as the fan club takes the victory with another kill against Alex Straza. They go for Porty Boss. The core is already down to 40% at this point and there's just no winning this anymore. What a performance so far in this grand final by the fan club. They take the massive lead and nothing changed. They are way behind. They need a reverse sweep in this grand final now. A 3-0 lead in the best of seven. One more loss, and it's all over for nothing changed. Second place is still pretty good. Again, in total for the second season, uh, there's $10,000 on the line, uh, the majority of it here in the playoffs. So uh, both of these teams are going to walk away with a fair chunk of money for the efforts here. But still, as it stands, this series has been a little bit... Ah, uh, not really a beating. I mean, again, uh, nothing changed. Fought back valiantly and had a really nice performance on the first map and was nearly able to take it there. But now, of course, they are down three maps. Well, there's a winner bracket advantage for, for Granite Gaming, former Granite Gaming, Lauber's fan club. Therefore, they started with a 1-0 into the best of seven, but they won out two maps in a row. And if they take one of the potential four upcoming ones, they crown themselves the champion. Blaze gets banned. <laughs> kind of done with the follow-ups here. Towers of Doom is the map and the uh, traditional Tracer ban. What else do you actually get rid of now? Uh, is there anything else that I... I feel... I want to see... I, I think Junkrat. Junkrat has been played by Blick Hitney now so many times that I would say just get rid of him or pick him for yourself. It would annoy the hell out of me. These stupid mines the entire time and you can push back there. It's like... <clears throat> thanks, no. But it's ETC. Frontline. Makes probably more sense. So... Yeah. Uh, okay. First pick. <laughs> Last time they actually picked Junkrat first. Let's see if they're gonna do that again or if they're mixing it up now. Towers of Doom is a big map. Globals are kinda nice. When you can get them. As always, I, I mean, Abatha is up. There is a chance that we're gonna see an Abatha set up at some point for nothing breath. changed. The thing is, if they are so far behind, a lot of teams are actually then going in and say like, okay, screw it, let's YOLO this. Actually, one of the stories is mid-season brawl, I think it was, when uh, Dignitas won against, I think it was back then, Fnatic. Uh, Dignitas actually approached this entire, like, seriously, we were behind the stage and I walk to my commentator desk and I hear JPL say to the rest of the team, okay guys, we agree, we cannot beat Fnatic, so we just YOLO the shit out of this, right? And everybody was like, yep, that's what we do. So then they started to pick Stitches and Tyrande back then, and they all of a sudden crushed it and actually crowned themselves the champion. And everybody was like, what the hell is happening here? And it was literally because Dignitas came in and just said, we cannot win against these guys. They're way better than us. We're just going to YOLO it, and we're going to have a little bit of fun here and playing some shit like Stitches and Tyrande, which back then was just not a thing. So sometimes that mindset can just propel you to win games and series where previously you didn't really stand a chance. Similar thing occurred when Fnatic was able to take down MVP Black um, at BlizzCon. It was another instance. The same mindset for them. They went in, they said, we can't win this, so let's just go and play whatever. And yeah, they played out of their mind because they had no pressure. So maybe this is the case now for nothing changed.
and it could be reflected in the draft, which is pretty much the point that I'm trying to make now. A lot of mage bans now, also with Li Ming and Jaina taken away. Lauba and Johanna, Malfurion is in. And, well, let's see. The Rhaegar, Billion, a lot of comfort picks here. Rhaegar, Garrosh, Hanzo, all heroes that we've seen at one point or another during the last two series banned out against them for a reason. Chris? <laughs> yeah, Sylvanas, of course. I shall suffer! Someone donate to Copenhagen to get the uh, to get the Janaga skin, seriously. Granted, this skin isn't bad, but I would prefer the Ice Giant if they're already going for this one. Okay. Mm, let's see. Towers of Doom. Hmm. Yeah. John Grid for Big Kidney. I mean, again, that doesn't surprise at all. And the Haka. Okay, now we have the global in play. So now we can play him around that. Play around that. And what is Ty gonna pick for this potential last map of the series? Okay. <laughs> I mean, another mage would be nice for them. There's a lot that they could play still with Ty. Zaratul, I was just about to say, even if Zaratul is open, and there we go! Zaratul gets taken, and we're going to uh, the potential last map of this grand final, Towers of Doom, ladies and gentlemen. Lowers fan club against nothing changed. Game on! The fan club, everybody! Against nothing changed on Towers of Doom. Is it going to be the map where nothing changed makes a stand and turns it around, starts a comeback, or will the fan club crown themselves the champions of season two here. Henning on the left side for Malfurion, on Malfurion, for the fan club. Chris again on Sylvanas, Kopmagen on Leoric, Lauber on Johanna, and Ty on his best buddy, Zeratul. The right side of the map, nothing changed with Podiboss on the Haka. Global action for him, DAB on Anzo, Sport Billy on Garrosh. We have linked on Rega and Blake Kidney. At this point, pretty much synonymous with Junkrat. But yeah, Ty, of course, going into the same build. Even Booby adopted Ty's build now, as we've seen in this tournament when he played the hero once. It was a fantastic game on Alderac Past. Against, as it happens, nothing changed. It was an absolute incredible series. If you have not watched that yet, definitely check that out on YouTube. If you watch this here on YouTube right now, then definitely hit that video with a thumbs up if you enjoy the commentary and the games here. But I would heavily recommend that you look up the series between uh, Nothing Changed and the Vikings because especially, I mean, the entire series was honestly nuts, but especially All Direct Pass was phenomenal. Beautiful Heroes of the Storm. But as it stands in this one, we have Zabertool already waiting things out here and waiting for an opportunity to go for a jump and get a bit of damage in. Obviously, the main targets are going to be the two squishies in the back line. And he has to be careful, main... I mean, there's two... Oh, <laughs> Billy, yeah. <laughs> Trying to make sure that he can uh, slow down the approach on the left side and maybe even uh, uh, yeah, deal with this camp a little bit. I don't think that they eventually... He has to move off eventually. He's not going to have a big impact on this one. Or is he? Can they clean that out quickly enough? I mean, Link is nearly done with it. And on the left side, there's a small play, but the rest of the team rotates in. And yeah, so far, so good. But I was just talking about Zeratul and about the targets and what he has to be careful about. So first of all, he wants to obviously go in an ideal world for quick kills against Hanzo or Junkrat, Vega to an extent, but the squishies are more so on the menu. The problem is that you have to be careful with isolation, the drag on the Haka, and also Garrosh in and of itself. So Ty needs to be cautious when he plays around that. It's not really an easy jump in, jump out play from Zeratul at this point, but he has proven in the past that he can make these plays. It's actually interesting. The development of Ty as a player has been pretty fantastic because at the beginning of the year, nearly no one had heard about the guy. He actually did apparently, or was also scheduled to play a couple of tryouts for some of the HTC teams. But when you talked about the average player or the average viewer of HTC, they never heard about Ty before. He started to make a big name for himself in the Nations Cup actually. It's kind of fitting that we're now talking about how good he is as he gets completely zoned out and dragged apart here. But again, bought himself some time and his team to drop the wall down at the bottom. But he made a name for himself at the Nations Cup and then got picked shortly after by teams and uh, is now playing and super stable here. The thing that is interesting though as we're talking about Zeratul and why I actually started to talk about this is that 
at the beginning, when he was really hyped, he started to make a lot of very aggressive and very risky plays because he always seemed to feel that he needs to justify the hype in himself and the plays that he made in the past. But since he was going up against much more, much stronger teams than in the Nations Cup, specifically when he played in Division S, he was oftentimes punished for that. And uh, I talked to a few of his teammates back at the time, and they said like, "Yeah, we still have to." We have still have to make sure that he slows down a little bit and tell him he doesn't have to prove himself in every single instance because he is good as he is, but he sometimes overextends. And just look at the kill that he gets now against Hanzo. <laughs> I mean, he jumps in, gets the Hanzo kill, and the counter kill against Johanna, but uh, Zeratul is already on the move again for a second one, and there it is. Rega goes down, so Tai is starting to wield his Wobble Blades here like a surgeon wields a scalpel and takes the opponent apart in the back line. Yeah, patience, little grasshopper, is sometimes a virtue. And Tai has shown that throughout the entire year. Has started to calm down his play a little bit, but still makes these plays when he sees value in them. And could get a kill against Sport Billy, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, Billy goes down. This time it's against Chris's damage over time. And now a level 10 abilities also give us the wormhole. Very few players these days actually still pick that. Seek in the Dark has been a talent. Oh, that Tai picked a lot. But lately, he has started to move back to Wormhole, even though the talent was nerfed. If you calculate your plays properly, you can still use that quite effectively. Also, tricky shuffles into Taste for Explosion and the Dirty Trickster. Highlighting it mostly because we've been talking about Junkwed's build quite a bit lately. And there's two variations. I highlighted both of them. But this is a norm for at least, Jun well, at least Blake Kidney. But yeah. Yeah, the 10 abilities still a little bit farther away uh, when it comes to the channels. We have now two for one, the traditional trade. The Dirty Trickster already with the Dirty Tricks. Ty then again with a couple of Dirty Tricks himself too. Oh, the drag! And Zeratul comes in and gets the kill but gets punished for it as well. Thing is though, with Zeratul being taken down, it allows now Lauber to move away from this because he was the one that they were originally targeting. Uh, still a killer for a kill. That's, that's a way more kill every game than we've seen previously. That's a really cool one. So yeah, they're going in for the aggression. Copenhagen is moving out of harm's way. Single altar now at the bottom of the map. 11 stacks for the Shadow Hunter. And once the tie has this one completed, it's gonna be nice for him to get that extra cooldown reduction with a few auto attacks, just weaving them in with the mechanical prowess that he has. It shouldn't really be an issue. But we still have the uh, level 10 ability, the Heroics, for the fan club slightly quicker. If they can delay this battle over the altar, they should be able to grab that one. Uh, and I'm honestly wondering when nothing changes is going to move back from here, because they need to be careful. If 10 hits, then a good blessed shield could take this quickly. Uh, there's the attack again. Billy is low, and Tanning gets the channel. Okay, they're not going to fight over this. Dehaka never made the move down to the bottom of the map. He couldn't give his team the experience. I closed the gap between the two teams, and therefore they didn't really plan of heading into a long, prolonged fight here anyways. Uh, still gets the drag against Ty. God, I love plays like this. Just delaying it, making sure that some of those minions are taken down before Ty can make it into experience range. And small plays like this can really add up if you want to get an experience lead over an opponent. It's a small play, it doesn't really do a lot, but again, these things just add up over time. Might of the Nerezim again. And there's the Blessed Shield. And again, on the other side, we now have the big problems for Zeratul. First of all, isolation. The Warlord's challenge is another issue. So Tai needs to be a lot more careful now when he makes these engages. Still two globes away from getting the cooldown reduction through his level 1 talent. Seven minutes into the game, we're going for camp control once more. It is pumpkin time! So at this point, nothing changed. Is looking at that spot where they are hoping to control Zeratul. If they do that, then they actually have a chance to really lock him down early in the fight and maybe get that victory. It would be, I mean, on the one hand, it's really, I, I gotta say, it's fantastic to see the fan club perform on this level. But it would be a little bit of a shame if that series would end with a 4 0. I mean, of course, if they can pull it off, then it would be well-deserved, but this has so far been pretty fantastic, and I would really, really love to see a few more games out of this. I was honestly hoping for at least one of the two series of the day to go the full distance. The loser bracket final has disappointed in that a little bit. Not in quality of games, but we didn't quite get the amount of games that we were hoping for. Maybe uh, the grand final is going to be slightly different here. The even exchange in uh, Belta, in uh, Altos, should not be an issue here. Yeah, Henning... 
and Podi Boss are the ones channeling it out. That's four shots against, four shots fired, and therefore no problem. Boom. Yep, we're looking at 24 against 32. Uh oh, that's an issue linked with the self ancestral. Yeah, Blizzard, it took them way too long to allow Rega to self ancestral himself again, but finally he's able to do that once more. And honestly, without that, he would not be in the meta at all. But it's cool to have him back here. Four kills against three, but heavy aggression now from both teams. And well, Billy is currently heavily controlled. I mean, every single time you look at Billy, he's on half HP. It's really tough. He, get, he eats so much poke from the font right now that it's honestly a problem for him to just get enough value and be as, as in the opponent's face as he normally wants to be. There's always pokes happening. Uh, Hanzo is trying to counteract that as well. At level 13, Talents are our next step in this game. And, well, there's not really a big lead for any of the teams. At least not when we're talking about structural advantages or experience leads. Ty is looking for opportunities to set something up. The Blessed Shield is always a big problem when it connects properly and with good timing, especially if Henning can follow up. I mean, uh, Henning really a little bit overlooked here in the setup, but the follow-ups that we've seen from him throughout the series and in previous games of the tournaments have been nothing short of amazing. Like, they have played together for a long time, and you can really tell. Oh, Black Kidney gets out. Nice throw against Leo. The problem is that Garrosh is dead. The arrow connects, but it's too late. And oh my god, Chris at this point, full on YOLO to the front, just saying, I might still get him. Nearly gets the kill, but damn. <laughs> Five kills against three, just as the altar spawns. Yeah, this could be another channel. This should be another channel. An easy one. Linked, the little doggy that could, trying to jump in in order to get the kill there. Needs to be careful because Ty is already smelling blood in the water. And linked with another self-ancestral. Has to push it out. Yeah, 20 points against 32 and they're getting this one as well. And Pody Boss? Yeah, okay, doesn't get locked down by the root. But was for just a second in a bit of trouble as well. So okay, the move straight on through the mid lane, uh, through the bot lane, apologies. Yeah, and if they can connect those, that might actually be the first bell tower. Oh, the drag dodged out by Chris. He's dodging everything, but he still goes down. Didn't have the wave anymore. Blessed shield and linked is dead. They try to get the kill against Sport Billy, but the counter kill potentially against Leoric. And he falls, tries to come back. Ty still looking at the setup, but has to jump back out. And that might be a kill against Johanna. Nicely done by nothing changed. Well played by them. Six kills against six, 14 against 14. The bell tower hasn't fallen. And as the previous games of the day, this one is also close. Yeah, even a bit of a lead now in experience for the team in red. Okay, they're starting to move in again. Sport Billy, half HP for him. <laughs> as usual now. And in terms of the damage, 20,000 for Zeratul, 18,000 for Johanna. Good wave clear from specifically Leo, of course. Can't quite hold up with uh, no, Junk Red, but still. And it's a triple altar phase. Triple altar, 12 point lead on the core, but this can change quickly, especially on Towers of Doom. You get a few kills, you get some momentum, you take down a few bell towers, and the game is going to switch in seconds. Two heroes without deaths Malfurion and Dehaka. Cam control again. At an earlier level 16, actually, for that here. Top exchange, left, right, uncontested. Yep, that's gonna be an easy one for the two. So the fight is focusing straight into the middle. And that bell tower, I mean, the hacker can move in here without a problem. And so does also Leo make his way down to the bottom of the map. Sylvana still trying to empower the push slightly. And honestly, if she gets get one through, that means that the bell tower gets converted. So DAB is trying to take care of it. But it also means that he has to split off the of them a little bit. More and that is also a 4 vs 5. Dehaga comes in. 16 is there. Quick pick on the talents possible. Black Kidney gets healed. And the stun nearly drops Ty on Zeratul. Again, he brings the threat, but he has to be careful as well. Blessed Shield is already coming out. They don't have 16 yet, but they still might get the kill against Sport Billy. The Entomb Copenhagen, you mad bastard. 
down goes Garrosh, and they get the kill against the Haka. Blake Kidney saves himself for a second. Saratul falls just before he gets the kill against DAB. Link gets attacked, and I think he's going to die. And yes, indeed he does. Now we're seeing also another channel. 12 points against 28, and they get the Bell Tower together with it. Three heroes annihilated. Tai, the only victim on the side of the fan club. He nearly got the kills, but he was dead a bit before it finally came through. And they seem to make the play for the boss here. Yeah, look at that. They actually go for it. All right. So Chris is sitting tight. Yeah, three heroes down. No global available. Pretty much nothing that can be done from Nothing Chain's perspective. And that's going to drop the red team down into the single digits. Single digits for them. But again, Copenhagen. I mean, that Entomb was insane. Can you imagine that after 20? With Buried Alive? <laughs> Eight points. Eight against 28, and they still hold on to the bell tower for a little bit more. I guess it's going to be reconverted right now. 17 versus 17, and whew, what a game again. Lauber, AFK at this point. What's, by the way, wrong with Lauber? What kind of tint is that for your cock? Seriously, dude, like, if anything, then it's a golden cock that you ride into battle, not a green one. I mean, something is seriously wrong with it if it's green. Mossy or something, like, I don't know. Yeah, that's... that's not... Yeah. <laughs> well, slight leading experience. At least no leading experience, if you're honest, for just a second. Still 18 versus 18. Yeah, by now they have... They, they really have Billy's number. They know the type of plays that he wants to execute here, and they're always double-checking. Lauba has also learned his lessons in previous games. He's not running into him any longer. Honestly, the global is really keeping them in play here. I mean, just look at the uh, experience that you've seen from the Haka. Leo has a similar amount here. Experience, especially mercenary experience in their hands now. And now we have the drag. Oh, actually, nice move. Trade activated. And there's the silence against Rhaegar. They go for Pody. There's a ton of damage on him. But Ancestral hasn't been thrown out yet. Hasn't really felt the need yet to go for the Ancestral here. For good reason. Arrow and the kill against Chris. Maybe. Oh, not even with a Riptire. Not even with a Riptire. Chris alive again. Linked in trouble. And another Entomb from Copenhagen. He ties and they cannot get the kill. Perfect in two, but Zeratul was on the channel. They get one. Mouth is down. And can they get counter kills? DAP is nearly dead. Link is low. Everybody's low. They can't get the kills. Finally, Ty gets at least one. But Chris has fallen too. That's a three for one trade. And nothing changed. Has the leading experience and the chances to go for the channel over here. Quick interrupt to buy a little bit more time. Not quite sure if it was worth to keep Ty on the channel and not have him participate in the team fight. I guess the call was made, but that backfired quickly. Ty is trying to buy even more time. He needs to be really careful. Went for the Might of the Nerazim. Still a battle between the tanks at the bottom of the map. And they're interrupting it even more. Leo is already back, but there's the channel and there are the shots fired. This would have been game, by the way. Four points against 24 now. Still a massive advantage. And since there wasn't enough momentum for nothing changed to get additional structures taken down, it just means that we are going to look at another big team fight. But they at least control the two camps at the bottom of the map. And just look at this. 10 kills against 10. 20 versus 20 in just a few. Honestly, this is just nuts. This series deserves uh, to go the distance. There is still a big chance that we're going to see the fan club take this with a 4-0 lead, but this deserves more games. We deserve more games, but we might not get them. The fan club apparently today is short on time. Oh, Billy into the arrow, but the nature's cure is ruining it. The Haka comes in. Zeratul isn't here yet. Zeratul is not here. Ty is on the move and says, boys, I want to play too. But they go up against Storm Talons now. And they take the camps down. 20 versus 20. And after the might of the Nerezim, we see the Twilight Falls and more importantly, Buried Alive. Ooh, yeah, that's where the pain comes in. Also, talking about painful. One minute on the boss. Uh-oh, and the double channel topside. They have don't have enough time to go for this. Do they fall into the trap? Billy! Billy! Oh, 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 they can't suffer a loss now! DAB goes down! Ty tries to escape. Oh, they're buried alive against three! What an absolute execution! Or is it? No, it's not! 
They survive again. How does the kitten always survive this? He gets the Riptire in two down. The Orgs are dead. It's a two for three trade. They go for the Haka. Oh, the mace to the face. The five man team wipe as the Haka Rega and Junkrat all fall. And this is game. They take it. A 4 0 victory for the fan club as they claim a big W over nothing changed in the grand final and crown themselves the champion of season two of the Heroes High Premier Series. Congratulations and well played. Hey guys, thanks for watching today's video and I hope that you enjoyed the match and the commentary. The remaining time of the video has been added to protect against spoilers caused by the length of the video itself. But please keep in mind though that this does not only mean more work for me but also has a negative impact on the popularity of the videos and the channel because of YouTube's algorithms. It would be greatly appreciated if you'd consider supporting the channel and help me to continue the daily esports coverage by clicking the join button below the video or supporting me through the Proterium page linked in the video description. Thanks a lot for the support and see you guys next time.